What is what am I supposed to do? Is it okay? Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Ready? Eight. Thank you for coming. It's so beautiful outside. I can't believe the room filled up. <laughs> but thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Tracy Nally. Uh, I am a local attorney. I work for News Gazette Media. So I work for, you know, an established conventional uh, media group in town. And uh, I think the reason why I was invited to this is because, uh, as such, I am a real believer in free speech, people being able to say what they want to say in a considered, peaceful, thoughtful way. Uh, whether they agree with me or not, you know, especially if they don't agree with me. So, um, <laughs> so um, that's why I think I'm here, and I'm here to be the moderator today. Now, it's, it's very likely that I won't have to do anything but introduce the panel, <coughs> and that would be a really good afternoon. So, um, also, also one other thing is that uh, I also have I have a 37 year career as an attorney and part of that is in employment discrimination. I've had a lot of experience in employment discrimination and I've seen over these 37 years a lot of different kinds of discrimination develop. Like there wasn't disability discrimination when I graduated from law school, there was no age discrimination or it was just new, brand new. Sexual harassment was not considered a form of discrimination when I graduated from law school. So I think we're now on the beginning of another type of discrimination uh, under, you know, with respect to transgender. And uh, I don't know how that's all gonna fall, you know, develop in the law, but I'm very curious and I'm gonna be a very good listener today so that I can have a considered opinion about it, and I hope you all join me in listening closely and participating in this conversation. Uh, today's speakers have traveled a long way to be heard, and our time is limited. Anyone disrupting or interfering with their ability to be heard will be asked to leave. Now, each this is the way it's gonna go. Each panelist is gonna talk for eight or 10 minutes, serially, and then after they're done, uh, we will open it up for questions and discussion. Um, the three, I'll tell you the, the names of the three panelists now. And uh, before each of them starts to talk, I'll read a short description of who they are. And then they'll tell you about themselves. But the three panelists are Corinna Cohn. from Indianapolis. Having undertaken hormone therapies and sex reassignment surgery as a teenager, Corinna addresses the responsibilities accrued by a male inhabiting the social role of women and what young people should know before making an irreversible commitment to transition. Thank you, Thank you for everybody for coming out today. Uh, let's talk about football. <laughs> there is this thing called CTE, chronic traumatic uh, encephalopathy. Have you heard of it? Yeah. yeah. Football is a sport that everyone in America, or many people in America, love. But there are some people who say football players in the NFL and in college are getting injured and having these permanent brain in injuries as part of their sport. And they're saying players should be safer, the NFL should be doing more to deal with the, the medical issues. And the NFL and some talking heads in return say, you hate football. If you criticize the NFL, you hate football, you're trying to ruin the sport, you wanna bring it down for everybody. We've gotta, we've gotta bind together and protect the NFL from their players with the brain injuries. So I bring this up because I'm going to say some critical things about the trans community today. And it's not because I hate the trans community. It is because I see that in the trans community there are 
some things that are analogous to people getting brain injuries. Wasn't planning to say it that way, but um, <laughs> there's, maybe there's some truth to that. Um, the topic today is whether material reality matters when it comes to sex and gender identity. Well, a couple of years ago, it was my first opportunity to have an exam with my physician, a, a full physical. And the question of whether material reality matters doesn't occur to you when you're having a prostate exam. So today we're here to talk about the conflict between gender identity and whether biological sex matters anymore when gender identity is on the rise. My answer is that yes, uh, biological sex does matter. Um, I'm a transsexual and it's only possible for me to be a transsexual because I was born one sex and I undertook a series of treatments in order to change my sex to appear more like the opposite sex. If biological sex doesn't exist, then you can't transition. There's nothing from which to transition from. So before I get too much further, I want to define a couple of my terms. Because I'm going to be talking a little bit about transgender ideology. And I think it's only fair for everyone who wants to participate in my conversa or this conversation that I define my terms first. So transgender ideology is the belief that bio biological sex is subordinate to one's personal identification as a woman or a man. Transgender ideology asserts that it's impossible to define female in a way that doesn't exclude trans women or male in a way that doesn't include trans men. That's going to be the whole of my definition of transgender ideology. I think that there's some other surface areas to talk about with it, but to me this is the, the core of it. That if you, if you believe something or wish something hard enough, it changes reality. What I know from my own experiences is that as much as you can alter your appearance or your body, uh, there's still something underlying that's permanent and true. When you face it and you accept it, it makes your life a little easier to deal with. <clears throat> Another term that I'd like to define is transsexual. Uh, just upstairs a few minutes ago, I was checking out the Trans Inclusionary Network event, and uh, I was introducing myself to somebody up there and uh, revealed that I was going to be speaking here, which caused a little bit of consternation. And I said, don't worry, I'm a transsexual. And they said, well, nobody uses that term anymore. <laughs> <laughs> which I know, uh, and I'm going to address that. But it's, it's so relevant because I'm told, don't use that word. We don't, we don't want to hear it anymore. Um, so a transsexual is someone who has been diagnosed with and is receiving or has received medical treatment for the conditions we call now gender dysphoria or uh, at the time that I transitioned, gender identity disorder. So you cannot identify as a transsexual without taking steps to transition any more than you can identify as a football player without going out and playing football. The action of doing is what defines you as the doer. Identity is meaningless. Um, so when I transitioned, the, the term transsexual was the, the common phrase. And it was even a couple of years, maybe about 1995, before I even heard the word transgender. It just wasn't in common use. Uh, what I learned upstairs a few minutes ago is that there's a, an entire generation of people who have never heard anything, uh, in, in any other word to describe people like me, that transgender is, is the normal word, the accepted word. Uh, and it may surprise you to hear this, but transgender is fairly recent. About tw 2003, there was a book published by uh, an academic named J. Michael Bailey who is uh, up at Northwestern, I believe. And he published a book that was titled <clears throat> The Man Who Would Be Queen. The book was about his interactions. He, he went out to, to meet and interview and document transsexuals. And he uh, agreed with Ray Blanchard's uh, categorization that there's basically two types of transsexuals. Um, homosexual transsexuals who are only interested in 
uh, date, having relationships with men, and uh, autogynephilic transsexuals who um, have a uh, sexual attraction to themselves as women. Regardless of, of whether I agree with those categorizations or not, uh, J. Michael Bailey received a lot of heat from trans activists for publishing this book. Mm -hmm. There were activists who complained to Bailey's employer to try to get him fired. Uh, there was an activist named Andrea James who found pictures of Bailey's children on the internet and then uh, put sexual innuendo uh, phrased over them and sent them to him to harass him. Uh, and they tried to ruin uh, Dr. Bailey professionally and personally. The people doing this were considered to be pillars of the trans community. Um, aside from Angie James, I'm not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna mention the others, but I did a text search of the book. Remember that this was published in 2003 for the word transsexual and the word transgender. The word transsexual is used over 200 times in the book. The word transgender is only used 26 times and it doesn't show up until halfway through the book when Bailey is choosing to use it to describe it as a homosexual or transgender homosexuality to uh, differentiate it from uh, what we would normally think of as homosexuality. So even back in 2003, it wasn't really considered a, a mainstream term, even for an academic who was writing on the topic. So the next major milestone was a book by Julia Serrano called Whipping Girl. And in my opinion, this is one of the most important uh, writings in transgender community because this established a lot of the um, ideas that are now extremely prevalent in the community. Um, Serrano popularized the terms transgender and uh, cisgender. And this was published in 2007. So this is when the conversation really started to change and the language about how we talk about trans issues started to change. 2007 was about the early period of the internet. There was no Reddit, there was not really social media quite up and running yet. And before that time, if you felt like you were perhaps trans and were seeking some information on the internet, you would go to sources like um, I'm, I'm gonna forget the name of it. There are a couple of, of trans uh, bulletin boards, uh, Susan's Place. So if you're looking for information, that's about the only place that you could find it. These were kind of out of the way byways where if you're going to join and participate, you would create um, some sort of alter identity and try to like learn about the community that way. <clears throat> Contrast that with today's world where we do have Reddit there, I would have to guess about 100, does, let me explain Reddit in case you don't know. Reddit is a, um, a forum on the internet that has thousands and thousands of different categories for um, topics. And Reddit makes an effort not to be too censorious. So pretty much any topic that you would care to discuss, there's a forum on Reddit to <coughs> talk about. Uh, there are probably about a hundred different trans-related subreddits, and that's that's the, the, the topic board. Many of them are um, created to create these circles of validation. So if you can imagine being a person who you don't feel like you have a place in the world necessarily, you're not comfortable in your own skin, feel like you look a little strange in the mirror, like your body doesn't quite look like what you mentally think it ought to be. You wanna reach out and you wanna see if there's other people like you. Well, uh, there's a lot of these spaces on the internet now between uh, places like Reddit and Tumblr, where when you come to these communities and you say, I don't know if I'm trans or not, almost unanimously, every voice that you hear is going to say, yes, you are trans, yes, if, if, if you're coming to us presenting as a boy, yes, you, you can actually be a girl inside, you just seize it. And um, 
there's, there's not a lot of critical inquiry, like, would this work well for you? What do you want to get out of it? Um, you know, are you aware of some of the, 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 the dangers in taking these um, medicines? Do you know that some people who are trying to do it are trying to solve one problem when they have a different problem? That there's very little service, like um, consideration of who's coming into the community. It's, it's like this big whirlpool that pulls people in. This coincides with the rise of what is now called intersectional feminism, where we define people in terms of all of the different sort of categories they belong to. So for example, I, I would say that I'm a, a white, transsexual, uh, half Jewish, um, what is it, neurotypical. Uh, <laughs> you're laughing, but this is, this is very body, much. This is Able-bodied, yeah, right, thin. of vision. Yeah. What's that? Thin. 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 Well, <laughs> see, you should have seen me a couple years ago. Um, yeah, thin. I have thin privilege. Uh, which, uh, okay. Um, but the premise of intersectional feminism is that the world needs to be a more fair and just place, and the way that we do this is by being very aware of what privileges we have over other people. But unfortunately, even though this is like a good premise uh, and something that, that people should be considerate of, it has been weaponized and used to drive people away from each other by defining tinier and tinier and tinier categories and then also implicitly asking people in these categories to sort themselves into a hierarchy. And wow, intersectional feminism creating hierarchies, maybe that's not a good idea. So in these communities, uh, people who were born male and were raised male, or went to college, had successful careers, families, children, all as male, they begin identifying as transgender. And that suddenly moves them from whatever position of privilege that they had occupied into being uh, extremely oppressed, uh, allegedly. Whereas on the other hand, uh, girls that get pulled into this, and um, I'm sure that there are some more uh, like adult women who, who start to get into this a, a little bit, uh, but this, is, this seems to be especially pernicious with um, girls and young women who uh, adopt names like Aiden or Lucas. Um, they start wearing um, breast binders. Um, and uh, on Tumblr or on, on Reddit, they get lectured and browbeaten to prioritize the emotional needs of uh, transgender males. And uh, there are some stories in some of these communities where uh, the males in these positions use this in order to sexually predate um, women. So this is not great. Uh, women and, and girls are being separated out and being told not to trust themselves, not to report these sorts of things, that if trans women are uh, predating on them, that not to go to the justice system because they won't be treated fairly. And honestly, I don't know how to fix it, but I think the first thing to do is to recognize that it's happening. Uh, so this is taking me towards the end of uh, what's been developing on the internet, and that is the term TERF. Uh, does anybody not know the term? Okay, good, good. Uh, the, the, it's an acronym and it stands for Transgender Exclusionary Radical Feminist. TERF. It was originally coined by an Australian feminist blogger who goes by the handle TikTok. But even if she coined it, um, she is not the person who popularized it. Uh, you've probably all heard of the term feminazi. And can you tell me what name you think of about feminazi? Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh was not the person who coined the phrase uh, feminazi. It was actually a, a professor named Thomas Hazlitt. But nobody probably knows who Thomas Hazlitt is. But Rush Limbaugh gets all the credit. Well, <laughs> yeah, credit. Um, <laughs> the notoriety. The notoriety. 
Thank you. Like the term feminazi, the term Turk was popularized by a trans blogger who is the editor of a website that's called Trans Advocate. And the editor is Kristen Williams. And Kristen Williams created a, a website called The Turks and spent a lot of work on social media to get, their, to get the, the trans community to start labeling women who were speaking about this issue, who, who were speaking about gender critically as a turf. The, that was about 2013. Over the last couple of years, the term turf has appeared in all sorts of threats of violence. There was somebody who openly attended a, a trans parade with a bloodied shirt that said, punch a turf. Uh, there was uh, just the last week, I believe, I, I guess the, the term turf wasn't brought up. I think somewhere, somewhere there was somebody who um, had a t-shirt that said something like, I kill turfs. At, at, at feminist or LGBT events, advertising these messages of violence. And these messages are excused. The people defending them say, trans people are oppressed, and therefore you should not be censoring anybody who is expressing these messages of violence because they are expressing these terms towards their oppressors who are women, who are frequently lesbian women. Looking at it from a higher view, what we're seeing is LGBT events where male people are openly expressing violence towards women using misogynistic phrases, and that these people's needs are being prioritized over everyone else attending. This is an aspect of the transgender community that has to change. So, Women were the original target of the slur turf, but as more and more voices started speaking up saying, maybe there's, maybe there's a middle ground, maybe there's, there's something that we have to uh, do so that both women's needs and trans needs are, are, are met. Like, how, how do we compromise? And those people also started being called turfs. And then uh, eventually, I think maybe, Sometime late afternoon, the first man was chiming in on this. Um, sorry, cisgender man. Um, uh, somebody said, hey, I, I think it, maybe it's not fair for somebody who uh, achieved adulthood as a male to be competing in sports against women. And now that man is a turf. And now anybody who says, hey, biological reality matters and is relevant and material reality is important is a turf. So if you happen to agree with me that bio biology matters, that you cannot be a transsexual or transgender without moving to a different state of, of being, um, starting from male or going to female or vice versa, if you agree with me that you cannot wish your way into being a different sex, then you are also a turf. <laughs> Every time this word gets used, it gets robbed and leached a little bit of its meaning. It used to be terrifying to be called a turf. It is becoming more and more normal or less shocking to be called a turf, even though it still does have uh, material effects on people. But the more people who, who misuse, or actually I don't think there's a good use for it, but the more people say it, the less, the less punch it's going to have. And if anyone ever accuses you of being a turf, I think you should say, so what if I am? In fact, I know a transsexual who's a turf, and they're thin. <laughs> Because of all of these word changes, one of the words that's been buried is the word transsexual. When I transitioned, there were basically two groups of us. There were transvestites or cross-dressers, and transsexuals, and the transsexuals were the ones that went all the way. Leave it to your imagination. 
<laughs> um, and there was really no middle ground. So there were some people who thought that there ought to be a middle ground. And the term transgender was starting to, to be used to represent that middle ground. And that middle ground is largely occupied by gender non-conforming people who uh, don't want to their appearance to be clearly male or female. Um, I think today we call them non-binary. Um, it's occupied by um, cross-dressers who wanted to, the opportunity to uh, live their, their lives day by day. I'm going way over on my time, aren't I? No, keep going. Um, <laughs> and uh, really, most importantly, the, the tr that's trans transgender middle is held by adult males who transition and do not want, they want to have hormone treatment because uh, they, they feel that it's, it's good for them to, to do it, and I'm not going to judge that. But critically, they don't want to have surgery on their their bottoms. They want to keep their, their malehood intact. And it's really important that if you are in this category, that you try to knock drag queens out of it. Drag queens used to be transgender. I don't know if you know. They're not allowed to be anymore. Um, but if, if you are in this position, you have to knock the other people out of the boat because if somebody says, well, what's the difference between a, a transgender and a transsexual? And you say, well, a, a, a transsexual has gone all the way and had surgery. Um, and then a reasonable person might say, well, that seems like an okay place to draw a line in terms of public accommodation. And we can't have that line drawn if we're going to include everybody. So I actually don't know the right place to draw the line. Um, what I do know is that the word transgender has eclipsed everything about my identity that when I go up to a room full of uh, tran the trans-inclusive network and I get told don't use the word transsexual. That's not my group, those aren't my people. Um, we've, we've been pushed out. Um, for gender dysphoria and the portrayal of transitioners or detransitioners in the media. Thank you. I'm going to stay sitting because I'm lazy. And, um, just to say like that is a very ambitious topic and it turns out that that's more of a half hour, 40 minute topic. So this is going to be much more of a detrans 101 kind of thing. Just like no. Um, so, uh, this is going to be about detransitioners and how we responded to. I'll give you a little bit of context on me and why I'm a credible source on that. And then context on the changes in the structure of trans healthcare in this country and the likely increased prevalence of detransitioners. Yeah, I'll switch. Okay. Am I, can everyone hear me in the back? No. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'll stand. <laughs> I know. 37, and the energy's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 Okay, okay, calm down, okay. So, um, I was trans-identified, uh, I'm detransitioned. I did take uh, testosterone for nine months. Um, I detransitioned in 2014, so it's been a minute. Um, when I detransitioned in 2014, it's important to keep in mind that this all occurred in the shadow of the word turf. So when I detransitioned, um, I was very scared of uh, my peer group finding out that, um, I, I, that I was thinking critically about this and that I would be labeled a TERF and what that would do to not only my peer group but also my career prospects. So I had an anonymous blog, I blogged under the pseudonym Maria Katz and that's kind of what all my detransition peers were doing at the time also. Um, in 2016, Julia Serrano um, <laughs> uh, wrote a little essay about us and about how we don't exist pretty much and how we are a right-wing trope. Um, so it really pissed us off and we decided that it was time that we had some visual evidence of our existence out in the world, right? So 
Uh, we made some YouTube videos because you don't really exist if you're not on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at the time, it was it was a big deal. There were you could not go on YouTube and see detransitioner videos. Now you can kind of see lots, and I, I encourage you to check them out. Um, out of that, I began YouTubing kind of advice for detransitioners, which at the time was a big deal. In 2017, I presented at the United States <laughs> Professional Association on Transgender Health at the first professional presentation on detransition mental health care. Um, it was a little scary, but I got to tell you that that um, presentation was pretty warmly received. Everyone stayed chill and relaxed. So later in 2017, we were encouraged by an organizer of the Philly Trans Health Conference to present that presentation at Philly and a presentation on alternative methods of dealing with gender dysphoria. Um, about two weeks before we were supposed, before the conference that was canceled. It was deplatformed because people felt that it was so controversial that it was going to result in violence. And also um, that um, parents of trans kids would come to our presentation and get the wrong idea and stop transitioning their kids. That was a prominent fear about us being in the mix. Um, in 2018, so last year, I was profiled by The Atlantic um, in a short documentary that was an accompaniment to that intensely controversial Jesse Single article about pediatric transition that came out last year. Um, I did that, I participated in that video um, about a month before I had to graduate and take two licensure exams. Don't do that, that's not self-loving. Um, uh, so I've done a lot. And I, I have to, I'm bragging, first of all, but um, uh, I just wanna say that me and my detransition peers have been actually in the past five years incredibly effective at building community and support for detransitioners. It's, I, I think that we've done an amazing job. Um, I will tell you that I get tons of, um, I get tons of feedback about my appearance. I get tons of feedback about um, how the fact that I've cultivated such a normie appearance um, means that I couldn't have ever experienced gender dysphoria, which is a really bitter pill to swallow because I still sometimes, when I'm going through times of stress, will have intense levels of gender dysphoria. It is a double bind, which is we are all as female people subject to, because I'll tell you that my detransition peers that cultivate, have, that have an androgynous or masculine appearance are accused of being non-binary in denial. <laughs> and I've seen this happen, I've seen this happen to my dear friends. So all I'll tell you is that there's actually no way to look um, that will affirm your credibility. Um, and uh, it's just the classic female predicament that there's no s way that the statements coming out of your mouth will take precedence over the statement that people attribute to your appearance. Yeah. 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 A little bit of detransition 101. So to detransition means that you're trans identified and you participated in a medical intervention to affirm that trans identity, which can be hormones, can be surgery, right? Um, there's also the term desistance that you're gonna see a lot into. Desist means that you're trans identified, um, you moved on from that without taking part in a medical uh, like intervention. Um, how many detransitioners there are is hotly deb debated and we have um, almost no research on it. So the best number that we have is a 2% prevalence rate. And I wanna tell you where this comes from and why it's such a lousy number. Um, so that comes from a Swedish public record search. So they did a study of Swedish um, uh, name changes from 1960 to 2010. And to be considered detransitioned for this study, you had to go all the way to uh, applying to change your name, and then go all the way to applying your, to change your name back. Um, just to say, I would not be counted in this statistic. I know about 300 detransitioners. I probably know about 10 who have done this, okay? So there's one way that this 2% number is like lousy. Um, another way that it's kind of lousy is that um, Sweden from 1960 to 2010 is a very different context than America. So for one, everyone who transitioned in Sweden during that time had to go through a really structured assessment process. There was no such thing as an informed consent clinic at this time, right? So informed consent is, um, at this point, the norm in America. Um, 
I'll also say that two out of every 100 people, which is 2%, is actually not a negligible rate. That's actually a lot. So um, a Williams study estimated that the amount of uh, trans people in America was 1.5 million. We can't assume that all of those people are gonna engage in medical interventions. But if we say that a third of them are going to engage in a med medical intervention, and we say that 2% of those will detransition, that's actually 11,000 people. So, not a small group that might need some support. Um, we hardly know anything about the experience of female detransitioners, um, and that's because research gets shut down. So in February of this year, a high court in the UK affirmed Bath Spa University's decision to um, not approve James Caspian's proposal to study detransitioner experiences. And they refused to do that because, quote, attacks on social media may not be confined to the researcher, but may involve the university. So research on detransitioners is controversial enough that we're just not going to do it. Um, so in fact, the best information that we have on detransitioners comes from detransitioners. And um, in, in 2016, a young detransitioned woman who blogs at Guide on Raging Stars um, put out a survey and found 203 female people who had either detransitioned or desisted. Um, she found 117 of them that had medically transitioned. Out of those 117, so they, this is 117 that's either gone through hormones or surgery, 41 had received no therapy before. Hmm. In, in her sample, um, the average age of coming out as transgender was 17 years old, and the average age of detransitioning was 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is if you look at Erickson's like classic stages of human development, mm -hmm. that actually lines up with um, the identity development stage versus the relational um, mm -hmm. challenge stage. So, so, um, so what can I tell you about even how many people are transitioning in America right now? Well, I can tell you that the HRC has 44 clinics listed in America that serve gender expansive youth. It's hard to try and get a number of how many kids are coming through those clinics. Partly because like our capitalist medical system produces really lousy stats. Um, in England where they have socialized medicine, they produce much better stats. So the Tavistock Clinic in the UK found that from 2016 to 2017, there was a 42% increase in youth referrals. Um, I couldn't find you statistics on the number of informed consent clinics in America, but I'll tell you that many universities uh, provide hormone therapy on an informed consent basis. Should I go in? Do you need to know what informed consent is? Great. Yeah. Yeah, so informed consent is a model of care where you sign over your right to see your doctors. So it means that you would check off a list saying, I understand there's very little research on testosterone long term. I understand that there may be effects of this that I don't want. I understand there may be effects on um, blood clots and mm -hmm. cancers. Um, but pretty much what you're saying is that like, you're safe, I won't sue you. Um, so many universities do this. That's, I, I did this also. I signed about a four page. I initialed four pages of I won't sue you, I won't sue you. Um, Planned Parenthood is also committed to providing hormone therapy on an informed consent basis. So from the Planned Parenthood of Illinois website for the agenda for getting hormone therapy, they say that the agenda for your second visit when you're seeking hormone therapy will be to review your lab results and get your prescription for HRT. Um, the Planned Parenthood, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood of Massachusetts website says that depending on your medical history, we will either prescribe the hormones to you at your first visit or wait to prescribe the hormones until we get your lab results. So at least, at least they're checking your cholesterol. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I'm telling you is that within the past 15 years, there's a massive increase in opportunities to get hormone therapy without any psychological assessment process. And this is why I am passionate about detransition mental health care services. Um, so I'm passionate, but I've got to tell you that besides speaking and writing about this, I can't really work on the project in a therapeutic capacity. 
um, because I feel like strongly for myself that I can't support pediatric transition. I worry that in 10 years, I'll have a lot of people to serve who have been through pediatric transition. And to be involved in trans healthcare right now, to be taken seriously and allowed to participate, mm -hmm. you need to be on board with the pediatric transition thing. So in the fall, I was approached um, to contribute a two hour presentation on detransition mental health care to a transgender mental health certificate program. Therapists will do these things where you pay a lot of money, like thousands of dollars to get a certificate. The problem was that the facilitators and the people who are gonna be making money from the certificate pro uh, program are like very aggressive proponents of pediatric transition. And I was like, I don't um, you know, I can't do this. What is pediatric transition? Oh, it's um, transitioning people under 18. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, Medically. Right, yeah, so it's providing hormones or surgery to a kid under 18, or um, puberty blockers, because um, that's a big part of pediatric transition is giving kids Lupron and other GnRH agonists um, to shut off their hormonal system. Um, is everyone bummed out now? <laughs> okay, so maybe I can talk about a little bit. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I wanted to talk about the, where are we at with your oh, you're over 10 Don't worry about it. Oh, it's great. Awesome. You're awesome. great. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to talk about what you're not going to see in mainstream portrayals of detransitioners versus what you are going to see when you seek out detransitioner produced media, right? And there, at this point, you have no excuse. There's lots of detransitioner produced media, okay? There's, um, let me give you some names. You can check out the Peak Resiliency Project, which is, yeah, classic. Um, which is a YouTube series with four detransition women. They also do a podcast called the Danger Ramen Podcast. Um, there's all kinds of blogs, all kinds of scenes. Um, I want to give you a all the names of the blogs, but I have an essay on Medium called Advice for Gender Dysphoric Teens that has a list of all of my top detransitioner blogs. And the main difference that you're gonna see is that one huge theme in detransitioner produced media is the idea of post-traumatic growth. And what you're gonna see in mainstream media portrayals of detransitioners is a lot of trauma and pity, okay? So, so post-traumatic growth is a psychological term and it's defined as the experience of individuals whose development, at least in some areas, has surpassed what was present before the struggle with crises occurs, occurred. The individual has not only survived, but has experienced changes that are viewed as important and go beyond the status quo. This is a huge theme in detransitioner media. People get out of trans identification and suddenly all these resources they had, that they had been dedicating to that project are free. So suddenly people end up finishing grad school. <laughs> they end up producing research. They end up doing zines. They end up making meetups. Um, they end up doing a whole lot. And so if you look at videos of people talking about your detransition, they'll describe years of just suddenly being very effective in the world. And um, that was certainly, that my experience with detransition is that since detransitioning, I've um, learned that I'm much more effective and powerful than I understood previously. Um, and that's not what you're gonna see in terms of magazines and uh, magazines and newspapers telling you detransitioner stories. You're gonna see a lot of uh, stories of trauma and people you feel a lot of pity for. And I have a personal experience with this. So in 2018, I, I, I agreed to uh, participate in this documentary by The Atlantic. I did not want to participate in the first place because um, uh, I'm not actually sure that I'm the best rep for detransitioners. I think in a lot of ways I'm a strange detransitioner. I transitioned old and um, I just don't want to rep. I don't want to be the symbol. Um, but I couldn't find someone else to do it, which I have a lot of resentment about. <laughs> and, and in the end, I saw Jesse Singles' article, and I was like, shoot, there's nothing in this article about the fact that detransitioners were deplatformed at Philly. There's a lot missing from this story in terms of detransitioners. So I said, I'll do this video if the video is mostly about what just happened in the past year. Okay, 
So it turns out you cannot negotiate with media production people. That's not a thing. <laughs> um, uh, so I had all of these, you know, things that was important to me. It was in the that I it was in the video. I really it was important to me. We talk about being deplatformed. It was really important to me that this be about like my role as a therapist. Um, and instead, the video that was produced was about a very sad woman <laughs> <laughs> that people evidently feel very sorry for. Um, and uh, uh, we had, uh, like, the video opens with a line that I was like fed. Uh, it turns out one of my lessons from this is that I should not talk to the media without a handler. Handlers are very important, it turns out. Um, and uh, it was a real trip. I would say that it was kind of traumatic. I get lots of emails from people who say that they're praying for me. <laughs> I get lots of people who tell me that Jesus loves me. It's like, fine, yeah, but like, I'm, it's all chill, you know. Um, and it was interesting to have all these people feeling really bad for me. Really bad. A lot of people saying that I need lots of therapy. Um, because, you know, I consider myself someone who can do things that a lot of those people can't do. Um, so it's interesting to have a lot of people pity you, that you're like, ah, oh, but you could not accomplish what I've done. <laughs> no, that's all. Um, yeah. So anyway, I would really encourage you to check out Detransitioner Media. Please check out the Peak Resiliency Project. Um, uh, there's tons of videos now. Um, yeah. I guess that's it. Thanks so much. Uh, our next speaker is Nina Paley, who is an animator from Urbana, best known for feature films Sita Sings the Blues and Seder Masochism. <laughs> an outspoken critic of both censorship and sexism, she has been no platformed and blacklisted locally and abroad for saying penises are male. <laughs> well, hey, um, I'm going to try to do this in 10 minutes, but it's going to be boring because I'm actually just going to be reading things aloud, and I know that's more dull, but I'll talk and interact as soon as that's done. So first, I want to read a quote from Daphna Whitmore of New Zealand from the 12th of March. Uh, I slightly edited it. Um, there's a Human Rights Act happening in New Zealand. I just changed that to law. There is a need to separate sex from gender identity. If there is inclusion of gender identity in law, that should only be if it is clearly defined as a distinct characteristic from sex. Sex-based exceptions need to be clear as they exist to protect the rights of natal women. Transgender people's identities should not be given status over women's rights to sex-based exception. Gender identity ideology is a belief system I do not subscribe to. However, I accept the right of others to believe in it, much like religion. Thus, I support the inclusion of gender identity only on the basis that it be clearly distinguished from biological natal sex. I share that opinion. All right, and now I'm going to read you the ever entertaining open letter to the University of Illinois, uh, an abridged version. It's about half as long as the one on my blog. In July of 2018, Arcadia, a cafe in Urbana, announced on Facebook an art salon at which my new film would be screened. The next day, Professor Mimi T. Gwyn commented on Arcadia's event page, quote, she's a transphobe. I will never attend your events now. My crime was, months earlier, sharing on Facebook the following lyric, if a person has a penis, he's a man. At various times, I have also shared such contentious views as women don't have penises, everyone is free to identify however they wish, but not to force me to identify them the same way, uh, and woman means adult human female. Nonetheless, if a person has a penis, he's a man, is continually quoted as my greatest hit of so-called hate speech. It is also a fact. 
When asked by other commenters why my stating biological facts was transphobic and grounds for no platforming, Ms. Gwynne replied, quote, I'm the chair of gender and women's studies. I know what I'm talking about. Wow. <laughs> Speaking not merely as an individual, but in her capacity as a UIUC faculty member, Ms. Gwynne threatened local business and libeled a community member and encouraged others to join in. Arcadia promptly canceled the event. <coughs> that October, my film, Seder Masochism, screened to enthusiastic audiences at the Vancouver <laughs> International Film Festival. In attendance were film, were film scholars Kristen Thompson and David Bordwell, frequent speakers at past Ebert Fests, who loved the film and emailed Ebert Fest director Nate Cohn to recommend it. Cohn replied, they already knew about Seder Masochism, <coughs> and it was at the top of their list. Later that fall, I turned down an invitation to judge a major film festival in Buenos Aires because its dates overlapped with Eberfest. Since Seder Masochism was at the top of their list, I didn't want to miss it. In January, I emailed Nate Cohn and Chaz Ebert to ask if, in fact, Seder Masochism would screen. For over a week, they didn't respond. That same week, I was attacked by a Twitter mob accusing me of hate speech, once again for having said, if a person has a penis, he's a man. Then, all trace of my film was removed from the website of a women's film festival called Els Tournant in Belgium after they were bullied by a Belgian trans activist. Still awaiting a response at the end of January, I emailed Ebertfest again. They replied, quote, sorry, we don't have room for it. <coughs> now, I'm not entitled to be at any film festival and the decisions of Ebertfest, a special event of the University of Illinois College of Media, are made behind closed doors, preventing any hope of accountability. But going from the top of Ebertfest's list to sorry there's no room in the midst of libel campaigns is consistent with the blacklisting and no platforming of feminists at universities nationally and internationally. From the banishing of noted feminist speakers like Sheila Jeffries and Julie Vindell, to the suppression of politically incorrect research at Bath Spa University and Brown University, to secret blacklists of female academics uncovered at Goldsmiths University, the speech suppressing behavior at the <coughs> University of Illinois is consistent with unsavory developments around the world. Many in this college town are afraid to voice support for me or express any gender critical thought for fear of being, tra of being branded transphobic. Academics elsewhere who even question gender identity have been disciplined or denounced in open letters. Those who express fully gender critical views have lost their jobs. Between that and the imposition of preferred pronouns, which require the speaker to suppress their correct recognition of biological sex in favor of compelled speech, that is lying, university employees, their spouses and friends feel compelled to keep quiet. So instead of the quote, opportunities for substantive civic engagement promised in the university's principles, the university instead fosters a climate of fear and silence in the wider community. Beyond this harm to our community, I have been harmed personally. I can't calculate the cost this has had on my professional reputation, career, and livelihood. I have certainly suffered psychological harm. Being falsely accused and shut down and intimidated in my hometown with no accountability for the accusers evokes a despair I had previously only read about in books like The Crucible and Histories of Witch Trials. The university needs to protect speech. I acknowledge the university is in a bind. Recent state interpretations of Title IX have, perhaps unwittingly, <clears throat> redefined sex to include gender identity. As long as Title IX fails to uphold its original purpose, protections based on sex, and instead protects incoherent, ill-defined, and fundamentally sexist concepts of gender identity, it is at odds with the First Amendment and with itself. Preferred pronouns are compelled speech, forcing the speaker to contradict their own recognition of another sex. This compulsion violates the First Amendment, but preferred pronouns also violate Title IX itself insofar as it still protects sex. Although trans activists vehemently deny this, there is ample evidence that some trans-identified males are autogynophiles, that is, fetishists who are sexually aroused by imagining themselves as women, which, by the way, I have no problem with. 
everybody is entitled to their own kink. But uh, being forced to call such men she is forced participation in sexual activity without consent. That is just one way privileging gender identity over sex is institutionalized sexual coercion. Sex and gender identity <coughs> are fundamentally mutually exclusive. You cannot protect one without delegitimizing the other. The university considers failure to use preferred pronouns harassment against the individual who imposes them. But preferred pronouns themselves are harassment, including sexual harassment, against individuals compelled to use them. My plea to the university is to reaffirm its commitment to free speech and acknowledge the untenable and inconsistent demands added to Title IX by the redefinition of sex. It is tragic that the former integrity of Title IX, which has been instrumental in providing sex-based protections and opportunities for women and girls, is now in opposition to the First Amendment. Free speech is important. Sex-based protections are important. Redefining sex to include gender identity is an assault on both. Thank you. That was under the Do I have any questions for you? Well, um, I guess I've been taking notes about all the places I should be looking for more research on this, quite honestly, because I, I'm such a square when it, when it comes to uh, transgender issues, and uh, I'm learning myself. So um, I admit it, I'm a square. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't have any Formal questions, no, but all right. How about from the audience? This is for both Carrie and Corna, and I want to ask you your relationship with passing and what that means for you currently and what it means for you in the past. Because both of you look obviously look are in very comfortable clothes, you know. But do you, when you're not really putting in even more effort, you know, we all have those days, do you ever get mistaken for as a guy? And does that ever, you know, does that bring back gender dysphoria? Or how do you feel with that now? Or do you ever get called, you know, sir? You know, or <coughs> he, you know, someone says in passing he, and what that means for you, what that meant for you back then in terms of passing and what it means for you now? Um, so I really wanted to pass. That was what my transition was about. I wanted to walk down the street being perceived as a guy. And then I got like terrible, terrible transition advice. Um, I went, I, in 2012, I went to the Philly Trans Health Conference. I got awful transition advice. Um, and I specifically got the advice that it was like transphobic of me to care about pa passing. And um, <coughs> that, uh, you know, that I should just like socially transition right away and like get on hormones right away. Okay, well if you have my body, mm -hmm. you, you can, testosterone does not in any way make me look male. So um, testosterone, because I was just like, it was just like, as I took it, it was just more and more clear that I was in no way getting closer to being perceived as a dude, like my dysphoria was off the charts, off the charts. Um, uh, no, I never, no, like people just don't, people don't, I, I don't think that people look at me and guess that this is in my history. People seem surprised when I disclose it. Um, the stuff that like increases my dysphoria now, um, uh, it's, mine is very, very body dysmorphic. So like when things are out of my control and I'm feeling humiliated or especially if the humiliation is sexist, mm -hmm. which it often mm -hmm. is. Um, I can, I, it's, it's not so, I just feel like total despair. And I'll, my, my sign that things are going off the charts in my life is that I'll um, be on medical um, vacation, let's say. That means I'm in a terrible place. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like the fact is that like life is not fair in terms of who can pass and um, what I found is that the community was like really in denial about how different it is for different people to be on the project of trying to pass and how much money had to do with it, how much skin.
skinniness had to do with it. Mm. So, um, so yeah. In some ways, honestly, if people like uh, get, I don't. This is a little problematic, but like if someone has a more successful transition in terms of like not going homeless and keeping their job and stuff because of hearing my story, I just don't want to be, people to be homeless and I don't want them to kill themselves. So, so that feels to me like a positive thing. Uh, as for me, um, passing used to be a lot more important to me now or than it is now. And that's because it was really important for me that other people viewed me the right way. Um, I don't know if it's because of my exposure to ideas from radical feminism or if it's because I'm getting old and just I'm losing the ability to, to, to care <laughs> as much. But uh, I don't have a right to tell other people what to think about me or how to perceive me. So a lot of people I interact with uh, I assume believe I'm female or don't give me reason to believe otherwise. Um, I don't correct them. If somebody, like the other day, I, somebody called me sir and I was like, oh no, my gender identity. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. I, don't know, I, went, I went home and <laughs> sat in a dark room and just, no, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have, um, there's like a core of your identity, and the weaker it is, the more you need external validation. And the stronger it is, the more you can find some validation inside yourself. I never hear trans people talk about that, uh, and it's really important. You have to be able to, to validate yourself. And you, you can't do it by getting completely wrapped up in the, the trans community, you have to actually go into the world and do something, a hobby or a career, um, and make and make a change of some sort to get that internal validation. You have to like participate in life. Very well. Thank you. Yes, over here. Uh, this question is for Caring. Um, you had mentioned that it's possible to get hormone treatments or prescriptions or whatever from Planned Parenthood on a second visit. Um, considering that this panel is about gender and material reality, I'm wondering where the financial resources are coming from in order to pay for those hormones and stuff? Like, is it being taken away from women who would otherwise receive services from Planned Parenthood? Wow, that's, I have no idea. I, I guess I, I don't know anything about Planned Parenthood funding. I'm really, I'm bad at that. So um, I guess that's a great question. Maybe someone else could speak to that better than me if someone knows a lot about how the funding breaks down. I'm just wondering if money is being taken away from women's services in order to accommodate this. Yeah. Well, Planned Parenthood only has a certain amount of money, so yeah. you can do the math. Yeah. yeah, and people that donate to Planned Parenthood, many of them have no idea this is happening. In the back. <clears throat> this is a question for Nina. Um, hi. Um, this term com compelled speech, um, it's the first time I've heard that. Could you elaborate on that more? Yeah, uh, so normally when we talk about freedom of speech, we're talking about not being censored, right? We want to say something and we don't want that shut down. Compelled speech is forcing us to say something that we don't want to say, that we don't want to believe. I mean, off the top of my head, when I was a kid here, the schools started requiring us to say the Pledge of Allegiance, right? You couldn't sit that one out. That's compelled speech. Uh, if, if I am forced to refer to somebody that I know is male as female, if I'm forced to say she, that's compelled speech. As opposed to, you know, being told not to say anything at all, as opposed to censorship. Okay, so um, I happen to be teaching at English at Parkland in 1994, 
Um, and prior to 1994, it was not, it was just considered a political opinion if you said the Dr. He on your essay. And I would rail with the students saying it should be the Dr. He or she. And they go, oh, you're just a feminist, okay. Then in 1994, <laughs> I believe that was the year, the um, MLA came out with the fact that it was an error to say the Dr. Mm. He, which I just really like a glorious moment. Um, so you had to <laughs> mark down your students and just say, it's not a political opinion. The MLA say that. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to, there is, there is something you're trying to protect that I'm trying to understand. Um, at that point, the students felt it was compelled speech. They felt it was ugly, ungainly. Mm -hmm. Now I have to say a sentence with he or she. It ruins the rhythm of, and I just said, sorry, it's an error. Um, that's gone away, okay. You are saying that you, I guess I think that speech is constantly compelled. The act of speaking is the act of delivering oneself over willingly to compulsion. That one has to say things that mean things for everybody. One has to say, how was your day? The stupidest expression in the world. All of that is participating in compulsion. <coughs> now, you're weird enough, and I'm weird enough, and I think we understand each other a little bit. But there's something that really, um, you're really furious about this compelled speech thing. I guess I figure, if somebody wants me to call them an elephant, I'll call them an elephant. I'll say, hey, that trunk is magnificent. So I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I think I think we're talking specifically about pronouns, and it's like, why won't I use? Why is like this thing a trouble to me? Yes, it is because when people are forced to deny the reality in front of their own eyes, that paves the way to fascism, and all of these fascists. <laughs> All of these fascist and totalitarian projects that we know about, and we go like, how could people do that? How could they do that? It's like, because they were homing to the herd. They were, their main concern was their neighbors and how other, what other people were going to say about them, rather than each person thinking to the best of their ability for themselves, right? I realize that you know, the self-other, you know, it's, a, it's a continual negotiation between self and other, uh, but there are times when I myself perceive reality, and I know it's fucking reality, right? Like, I trust my senses over what other people are compelling me to say. And then when they up the ante by, for example, no platforming my film, calling me a turd, calling me hateful, shutting me out of the community, things like that, then it's like, rather than going like, oh, okay, I guess I was wrong, I'm like, Nope. <laughs> it's like, I know what I am seeing. I know my perceptions. I'm not saying my perceptions are infallible. They're not. But everybody is entitled to their own perceptions, right? Other people do not get to dictate your perceptions and your <laughs> thoughts. And that means you can be wrong. You're going to hurt people's feelings. People might feel bad, right? But you take self-responsibility and you honor your experience above what other people tell you your experience needs to be. Thank you. Oh, that's so great, Nina. Thank you. Um, you just said something, Nina, about being called hateful. I guess I want to ask everybody about this. It's about hate, really, which is that um, I know I feel like the call for empathy is largely always out there. And I feel like, for me, that my positions are empathetic. And I imagine that everyone in this room feels that they have empathy. And when I feel like um, people lose friends when it comes to this topic, people lose um, you know, the respect or care of people that they care about, or they fear that they're gonna lose that. So how can we walk forward into you know, this world that we're in and address those who might call um, people hateful when it seems to me that no one here is hateful? And how can we address those people in ways that will strategically allow us to keep bridges open so that we can have conversations with people who disagree, who might just be willing to say, Nina, you're hateful. I don't think so. I don't think I'm hateful. I don't think that I, anyone up there is hateful. But how do we go about bridging those divides with people who are, I think are very well-meaning when they call us hateful? And that's for everybody. So do you have Create a panel discussion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, how do you, go, bridge, you go bridge the divide? Uh, 
you can't make somebody listen. <laughs> so I, I don't know that there's much else to say. Um, if, if you're ready to listen. I'm sorry, just it, you can't make people listen, but what if you're being shut out of your community and by, you know, a cafe and by your friends and family, it, it's, it really impacts you yeah. on a, in a material way. What if your employment is being yeah. um, targeted? Yeah. You know? Oh, it's up to me. I think the only thing <laughs> is the it's, death it's of the actually, internet. It's unfair. <laughs> and it's lonely. Yeah. And it sucks. And what you do is you say, hey, Nina, we should do something in Urbana. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> want to hear these ideas because no, no, I don't think anybody in this room has hate for anybody but when you feel like if you open your mouth people are gonna exile you you don't say anything so you start speaking <coughs> yeah what do you oh what he said <laughs> <laughs> about normies and I think a lot about squares and like people who don't know they don't know the context at all and like how often when I talk to people about like um, informed consent care and statistics and stuff they're just like they got they had no idea any of this was right. happening and so I guess I feel like you know I've been called hateful like a lot yeah. and I guess I feel like the person calling me hateful is not actually like my audience like it's actually normies that I'm directed mm, to. Mm. So I feel like the person calling me hateful, like they're working through shit, whatever, like it's gonna, uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, okay, you feel that way now. Things change, things change for me, I don't know. So I, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it. I feel like the, the people outside the context matter more. I don't know. Right, but if they're your employer and they're calling you hateful and they fire you from your job, yeah. You know? Yeah, although, yeah, that's true. I mean, you know what? Another thing is that when I left the community, I was like, I'm only going to be in normie contexts. I'm only going to have bosses. And, like, I don't, honestly, like, I don't hang out in, like, alternative spaces. I don't hang out with anyone who has, like, a, like a, a side mullet or, like, I don't hang out with vegans anymore. Like, I am normie. And that, no, but, but, like, but no. But I, and I don't mean to make light of your concern because people do get fired. Because um, it's it, people lose money, people yeah. lose housing situations. Um, yes, for some people there actually is not the right. option to to seek out safety. Um, but so I I don't know the answer. I'm just like that has been my personal strategy, and so I'm very focused on people outside the context. In the in the back there. I, I read the article, but I unfortunately can't hear you. Um, I read the article in the Atlantic, and um, I think what you did was really important. And I guess I'm thinking about bridges and shared experience. I mean, you went through this journey of being true to yourself, and it seems like the people who are trans are trying to be true to themselves. I mean, everyone is. So why is everybody's panties in a knot about this? <laughs> that it didn't work for you, and well, that's okay. And it worked for someone else. I mean, I just don't get it. I don't get why they're calling me hateful. You were just being true to yourself. Yeah, then I was public about it. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's people, it's very distressed people trying to resolve distress. So I think, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, this is a thing I don't, I can't figure out. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've been at it for a long time. I don't really know ethically what it, I think a lot about maybe, maybe I am being hateful. I think a lot about like it, yeah, I, I self reflect a lot about whether I'm an okay person. So. I, 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 I guess what I'm seeing is like each person is trying to find what home is for them and you're doing it in your way and then other people will find it in another place. Why can't we accept that it'll be different for all of us? I would like to address that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll get to you. So it is, true, it is true that there are very, very well-meaning people that are participating in these witch hunts and not, you know, they know not what they do. They're really, you know, with the best intentions, they're saying Nina Paley is a hateful bigot. Uh, but it's not 
just that. It's not, oh, what's happening? Mm. There's, there's political forces at work, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a grab for political power, and there are groups of people form, um, they form tribes and mobs, and having people to hate is, is a way that they bond with each other and consolidate their own power. So we actually provide a kind of service to <laughs> groups that are seeking power. Uh, and I don't know what to do about that, but I don't, um, it's, it's, what's going on is not completely benign. I mean, among all individuals, it, it certainly seems that way, but we're in kind of a sick society. We have been for a long time. Introduced to this society is the internet, and not just the internet, but social media, which is a drug that we've never been exposed to before, and I really think that the rise of uh, genderism, along with some other uh, movements, <laughs> like it just would not happen without the internet. There, there's, hum there's like social dysfunction on stero on, yeah, steroids. Uh, <laughs> 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 on, uh, on some kind of drug that we've never encountered before, and we can't stop it, and we can't step back and look at it. We don't really know what's happening. It's as though uh, you know somebody has like sprayed psycho drugs on everybody uh, in certainly the United States, and we're just going to see what's happening and what's going to happen. And this is what's happening, and I think it's unprecedented actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that just as totalitarianism was unprecedented in the early 20th century, this is unprecedented as well. And oh, which gives me a chance to recommend a book. The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, which is, uh, it has a lot of words in it, but um, maybe too many <laughs> words, but uh, excellent concepts. Oh, over here. Um, thank you. This is so, this is so refreshing for me and, and affirming in, in many ways because I've silenced myself tremendously uh, on these topics. Um, in in uh, academia, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. so th that is is it's been frightening for me, given that my job is to engage in critical thinking and guide yeah. younger people to do the same. But the whole compelled speech issue is is tremendously alive. Uh, whole questions of are you dead naming or are you doing all, all these things. I worry tremendously about pediatric transition. Yes. Um, because these are dangerous drugs that, that, for example, they have been tested on women with endometriosis with hor horrifying effects. Um, and, this, and these drugs, these so called puberty blockers, are given to block an, um, a development that yes. is mental physical, emotional, hormonal, all those things. So what happens when you stop something at a stage where you're supposed to be allowing, uh, eating better, eating more vegetables, exercising, <coughs> getting fresh air so you can grow, okay? So I, I think it's, this is frightening. Then, the, the bizarre language tricks that are played on people um, have me confused and, and, and I read a lot. So people <laughs> who don't have a depth of <laughs> hundreds of books that they have read, are, are, I, I suppose they must be even more confused than I am. Um, what, I, what I'd like to say is that um, 17 to 21 year olds, as somebody said, they're a very vulnerable population. Um, there, there are a lot of people trying to change their names, which is fine, I don't have a problem with that, but it, because people are searching, all, all, those, all those things. But I also think that um, um, the mutilating of the body yes. is a horrendous problem. So if we think that, um, that the, I would say no mutilation is, I call it mutilation, because I don't think that there's a need to take um, to take your breasts and chop them off. Um, I, I don't think that that's, that's like a necessary thing that will, that will make you be less oppressed, okay? So if we're looking at a, a situation where, where as, as a class of people, women have had to deal with 
um, less pain, less leisure time, less access to stuff. And then we think, oh, all we have to do now is, is, is chop off our breasts and grow a beard and then we'll be free, okay? I think that that's, that's it, tremendously misguided. Ignores the side of the room, yeah. so I'm going to focus over here. Uh, so I have two, two, two okay. things to mention. The first was in response to what do we do when someone calls us a hater? And I think one response that someone can do in that case is to ask them to define their term. What exactly are you accusing me of in detail? How is it that I'm being hateful? And exactly what is the negative impact that I'm delivering? And often people they don't want to do that. They want to have, well, you're a hater, you're a bigot, be a close to the conversation rather than having it be a conversation starter where perhaps we can figure out a way that we can coexist together. The second thing that I wanted to bring up, someone mentioned language game. And the language game, people say, well, it's just language. Why does it matter? Well, I think it matters because we've got this thing going on that's kind of like, I tend to call it the euphemism treadmill in reverse. So you have people saying, well, I'm a woman, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is, it's not just people saying, well, I'm a woman, it's saying that there can only be one way to be a woman, and that one way to be a woman has to somehow encompass the both of us so that there can't be any line driven between. So then, some women will say, well, we're oppressed. We have things that go on with us materially. From the moment that we're born, it's our body that is being judged. Women were not just denied the right to vote because of identity issues. We were, nobody asks the identity of girls. They're told that they got to go on a menstrual hut once a month. Okay? So, <laughs> all right, that's fine. If people want to be into the group of women, then maybe we will start saying that we are female. But what happens? Once people start saying, and this is the norms, right? This is women, this is lesbians on dating sites or whatever, start saying, okay, that's cool. I'm just going to say I'm a female woman or I'm a woman born woman. But it's a problem because you drew the line. So now that people come up with a way to say that, well, we also are female women. So they will say, I took hormones, therefore I have a female hormonal profile, therefore I'm also a female woman. Or I was born with, I am identifying as a woman, I was born with my genitalia, so my genitalia is women's genitalia, which is female genitalia, so I too am born with female genitalia. So what about that? So people say, okay. The female penis. The female yeah, penis. what you're talking about. Or right. cis. All right, so people on dating sites start saying, well, I'm cis. Well, now we got people saying, well, I already went through as much transition as I want, which sometimes includes, you know, the full thing, or not, which is fine. I can understand why people wouldn't. Also, <coughs> depend, you know, freedom. But uh, saying that, therefore, they should say that my gender identity no longer mismatched my body because I got body modification, so then maybe I also should be cis. So it's this thing that keeps on going because it's the, the, the important part is that there not be any line drawn. Whereas I think, you know, maybe we need to say that trans women are trans women and trans men are trans men, and that's great. And I think that there should be, absolutely should be protection in the law, orthogonal to each other for both sex for sexual orientation, which is about the body, it's about sex, you know, and also gender presentation and gender identity. There should be room for all of those things, and we should have legal protections for all of them. And it doesn't help anybody when we have people mixing them together, often out of well-meaningness, to say that, but they are that we're going to have gender and sex be the same thing. I mean, part of it started out with gender being a euphemism for sex, so that when they ask you sex on the farm, you don't do the 12-year-old boy thing and go, oh, yes, right? <laughs> but the problem is then, when, during that time, we wrote a ton of laws saying that we have gender protection. Yes. Right. And when we did that, we meant sex. <coughs> but now people are saying, well, we got this gender identity thing, so we should rewrite that. And that's where we get this conflict between gender identity and sex. We need to have protections for both of those. Nobody should be getting fired because they're not wearing the right thing. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have any of this old women gotta wear high heels to work or any of that business either. Some or a male person wants to wear the heels to work, power on, right? Right. So they're they're uncomfortable. This is where we're at. And so I think it just needs to be we need protections for all of those. And one of the things that's causing a lot of strife in the community right now is that because of this this mixture of gender and sex being defined the same thing, and in fact, you know, 
even in the, the Trump pronouncements, he does that too. But a lot of well-meaning people use the terms inter interchangeably, and so it provides this wiggle room that muddies up the water. But some people needed to use that, that area to get protection for sexual orientation back in like the 70s and the 80s. And it's 100% understandable why they did that, because it was the only way to do it. But now, hopefully we're in a more enlightened time in 2019, and we should be able to say that we want to disambiguate these things. We want to define them separately and have explicit protection for sexual <coughs> orientation in the law. And I think if we can fight for that, if everybody can get together to fight for that, it'll cause a lot of the, the strife, maybe, to dissipate somewhat. So, I've probably gone way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do want to go back to the pediatric transition because actually the more that you know about pediatric transition, the more horrifying it is. Mm -hmm. And um, I specifically, uh, I'm on this kick where I would like people who are anti-pediatric transition to frame themselves as pro-orgasm. Because a lot of times <laughs> what we're experimenting with is a kid's ability to orgasm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and um, so, uh, and specifically when we talk about male kids, so like Jess Jennings was on puberty blockers, which will halt your development in terms of ever of having an orgasm, right? And then he had bottom surgery as a, as, um, as a young person. Orgasm. So um, okay, there's... Defi defining terms, what's an orgasm? <laughs> <laughs> out of, that's out of my pay grade. <laughs> um, so like when we talk about like, you know, I, it's just like even if a child actually uh, remains trans-identified through their life. When we talk about a regret, we also could be talking about where does a 10-year-old does a, does a know what it is to consent to not being able to orgasm? No. Or, yeah, that's all, yeah. <laughs> okay. that's or fertility. fertility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not to have too much TMI here, but I started, I did my transition as a teenager, and you're, you're absolutely correct. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's okay, I have an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll come. When I grew up, there were only two categories, sex and sexual orientation. You know, and, and now we're just a lot more discriminating in our discussions, and I even learned a new one today that there's uh, gender presentation. I hadn't heard that one before, but there's all these different gender categories and sexual categories. And so I wanted to ask a, a, a question to, to, to Carrie and Corinna. Um, this is a thought experiment. Suppose that we lived in a society where people just accepted the physical body that you had and that other people had, and that there was, you know, male and female and a continuum, you know, mixture there, and physically, um, hormonally, psychologically, whatever, that there was, that people just accepted who we are and, and, and didn't try to shove people into <laughs> categories and say, you know, except for physical, there's male and female. If there was just acceptance, and um, do you think that people would still feel uncomfortable in their bodies and want to change their bodies if they were accepted in their feelings and that their feelings about themselves and their identity were just considered totally normal, whatever it was? Oh, um, I know it's a hard... I, 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 I wish that that would be possible. It seems utopian. Uh, the process of uh, puberty and the fact that you're not really um, mentally mature at the time that you're going through puberty means that even in the most accepting sort of environment, you're gonna feel weird about yourself and it's gonna become a puzzle that you try to solve. I think even, even in that sort of environment that you're supposing if it, if it could exist, I think that there would still be people who would, um, if they knew the transition was possible, would want to explore it to see if that was a way to find themselves. 
I don't know. I'm, I, you know, some of, this, <laughs> some of these things are above my pay grade. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that lots of kids have dissociative symptoms during puberty. Also, uh, it seems like a lot of women, when they're pregnant, have dissociative um, mm -hmm. symptoms. So it seems like when your body is changing very quickly, it's hard to be aware of your body's boundaries and stuff. I do think that if we lived in a, in a wonderful world where everyone was always offered dignity, uh, that would, I, I, we would all be mentally more healthy and, but, I get close. Here, Tracy. Yeah, yeah thanks Tracy. Um, so, speaking about compelled speech, it's not just socially compelled anymore. It is being codified into law in some places and countries yes. that if you misgender someone, it will be a misdemeanor. It will be, like, yeah, exactly. In Canada, for instance, the laws about recognizing gender versus sex have now defunded a women's rape relief center. And those are the real effects of why these politics aren't just personal. They affect services for people who need them. And it's very frustrating to watch it happen. And I have a 13-year-old daughter who thankfully is very awake and comfortable and knows, but all of her friends are compelling her speech. All of her friends are saying, you must be non-binary constantly to her because she doesn't want to paint her nails and wear a dress. Wow. All of her teachers are asking her, are you trans? Because she doesn't like the arts. You know, it's, this is, it's utterly ridiculous. And there, and then as a parent, I also am running into these stories where children are being removed from their parents because the parents are concerned about the health effects of these drugs. And they're saying, you know what, my 13 year old doesn't have the mental capacity to understand the damage they're doing to their body. I, as the adult, should be able to apply this, but kids are then, being taken away from their parents. Like, I know that happened in Ohio. Like, like there's one in, but. Yeah, there was a case at least about it. Yeah, it but it's, it, it is happening, and it's, it's terrifying that kids can transition at school and not have the parents told. And this is not college, this is high school and junior high. Where they're minors. Yeah. The, the, the camera will be on. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just hoping, uh, that the I would like the panelists to talk about the underlying sexism and misogyny of the contemporary trans activist movement. Um, you mentioned the Vancouver Rape Relief Center, and that you know that is evidence <coughs> of um, misogyny behind all of this, and it being much larger than just individuals and their preferences and personal stories. Can I add hierarchy to that? Because that's what we've missed. There is a hierarchy to this. Mm. Vancouver Rape Relief is women, yeah. and it's men who are shutting it down. Does that fit with yours? Yes, it is. Thank yes. You. Let's talk about the underlying misogyny to the contemporary trans activist movement, if you can talk about that, please. So first, where I go with that immediately is actually like um, the, the treatment of trans men within the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, great, yeah. So um, I don't know, my experience was that it sucked to be a trans guy because um, your sexuality was being patrolled. It was super problematic if you um, like, you know, only wanted to be with female people. People made fun of trans guys dating trans guys literally all the time. Um, and also you were like patrolled for like um, these secret like, you know, male privilege. Like if you talked too much, that was a big one. Like this idea that trans guys are always talking. And like, <laughs> um, and so I don't know, like I, that's, that was a trip. It's a trip to be accused of having male privilege when you still have tits and you're walking down the street with them. Like, <laughs> 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 uh, so um, I worry about it a lot and I'm laughing, but like some of the trans guys we're talking about are like 15 year olds and 18 year olds. Yeah. And it's so easy, like it's so easy to, prey on an 18 year old yeah. and guilt trip them about their sexuality and stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's that's immediately where I go. And um, yeah, I don't know if that answers. 
uh, I got sort of initially schooled in modern transactivism when I criticized the cover of Vogue that Caitlyn Jenner was on, uh -huh. as I was like, this is super sexist. This is not what makes somebody a woman, right? Yes. I'm a woman, and this, to see this depiction, everybody saying, yeah, sure, that's a woman. I was like, well, no. And then everybody jumped down my throat and said, you're a transphobe, you're a transphobe. And I was like, what a great cover for good old fashioned sexism, you know? Like they're making sexism look woke. And yeah, it's, it's intense. I mean, the, we've in many ways regressed. Uh, and the ideals of feminism that I grew up with, which basically said women can be anything, you can have any sort of personality, you can wear any kind of clothes, that's like, no, girls now, if they have the wrong, or a, the kind of personality like mine, people would say, oh, you're really a boy. Uh, and I forgot what I was going to say. But yeah, it seems like it smells like misogyny to me. <laughs> when you prioritize the feelings of a male person over the experience or life of a female person, I think that that's fair to describe that as misogyny or at least one form of it. I believe that we've come to the point where the word transphobia is used to enforce that dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, prioritizing one group's feelings over the reality of another group. And I don't think that's purely inside of the trans community. I think it's also from the people who declare themselves to be allies. Mm -hmm. I have a question that uh, for the panel from an experience I had probably 10 years ago as a university librarian, not here, but at a prestigious university in the East Coast, where the board of directors was trying to figure out what to do with the, what they're called their frosh. I mean, there were, you know, we couldn't, the, it was an important university for pronouns. <laughs> I had to learn them. Um, and. The, the problem was that at this university, people can live with anybody, but not their frosh year. In other words, sophomore, junior, senior, you can choose, uh, man, woman, whatever. But there were, there were two shrinks on the board who disagreed. What do you do about, um, I hate to pick on Nebraska, but I will, a frosh <laughs> from Nebraska being roomed with a person undergoing transition? And there was a big argument at this university about what to do. And I wonder what y'all think about that, because there was a lot of argument about, well, people go undergoing transition, there's a lot of psychological stuff going on, and a poor frosh from Nebraska who is uh, not, doesn't know about these issues shouldn't be put in this position. Is that still going on, or is it not? Is this an old-fashioned thing? I have a question. Are you saying that the frosh were segregated in housing by sex? They were se it's by sex, yes. And so the issue yeah. for the transitioning student was, uh, I mean, the way yeah. this is phrased, it's like there, there okay. seems to be two issues there. Like, yeah. I definitely have opinions about um, sex-segregated spaces, Right. Uh, that the criteria of sex now is how people identify. What happened is that frosh, a good question, I didn't say this. Yeah. They were putting transitioning people in single rooms. And the transitioning people said, this isn't fair. We want a roommate. What? We want to have the frosh experience. And this university was putting a trans And they people. wanted a roommate that was of the opposite sex. Yes. Because that well, they, they wanted a no. roommate that matched their identity rather than their sex. Yes, right? that's right. OK. Yeah, I mean, I all I really want, all I am asking for is for people to acknowledge the difference between identity and reality, yes. ideas and reality. <clears throat> Sex, you know, like it or not, it's based in material reality, and yes, we all know intersex exists. That does not mean that sex is a spectrum. It just means that, you know, biology is, is complicated and things happen, but there's no, like, third sex, there's no, you know, there's no, like, you know, no gamete gammy. that's between a sperm and an ovum, right? right. It's, and it's, uh, just look at sex. Like, if we're, if we're making laws, those have to be based in material reality. And, 
you know, one area that I completely agree with, with the trans activists, where they say, like, you don't know, you know, what's inside another person's head and heart. It's like, that's correct. Nobody knows what's inside another person's head and heart, right? Like, that's yours. You own that, right? But we can, uh, in some cases, imperfectly, observe material reality. And laws should be based on that, not things that we can't see, not things that nobody knows exist except you. It's, again, this, the separation of church and state. Uh, these assertions of, our, of identity, these are unprovable things. And that's not, it's like just because something's unprovable doesn't mean it's bad or wrong or I don't respect it or I don't like it or I hate it. It just means it's unprovable. And religion is fine. People need it, actually. People need magic and spirituality and all sorts of stuff. But that's, you know, that's not the realm of law. So one solution they could have done, and again, maybe they've changed this. I haven't kept track. But it just occupied a whole year of board meetings, um, so it, you know, which I attended. So what they could do is a survey about how do you identify, and then um, if you say transitioning, put two transitioning people together if they want a roommate. But the what trans, do do? the trans activist that I have dealt with has said that's not acceptable. Okay. You can't separate us. Separate but equal is not legal. Like right. they start so comparing themselves to civil rights mm -hmm. and like so different drinking fountains and things like that. And it's not the, biological reality mm. should be the deciding factor. So how do you do that if you're with kids coming to college the first? What year? is your sex? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. It's okay. so simple. What is your biological? Yes. Okay. In the back with the blue hair. Yes. There's only two of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I grew up in the 50s into my late teens, and I was a weird nerd, dweeb, dork, sissy boy. And I had no idea where I was supposed to be. And it, three times in one year in my last Two years of high school, I was hospitalized wanting to kill myself. I didn't want to live in a world of violence and injustice. And I certainly didn't want to be one of those men. And had male relationships. And then I was president at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and I realized you don't kill yourself, stupid, you make revolution. And in wondering what that revolution would be, I am now asking a question of, I think what I thought was I wanted to, I thought all the problems of history were due to men, that I wanted to make men in a good image as nonviolent people, and that was the direction I chose. And I, I don't know if I consciously stopped having relationships with men, but I know that what I was focusing on, and I don't really hear it in the room, was I think the problem is how our gender became. <laughs> and I don't want to make myself fit somewhere else. I don't want to make myself help men be nice. Yeah. Good, work on that. It's needed. I'm curious the, if the panel has anything to say about that. Well, really quick, I'll just say that having had an experience of like being in a very utopian-minded ideological community <coughs> that turned coercive, has um, given me a really rigid um, practicality. So I, I honestly consciously train my brain to not think about utopian stuff. So like, I don't know how the world should be, I don't know how men should be, I don't know how women should be, but here I am and like, here are the people around me and how are they behaving and are they, behave, are they giving people honor and respect? Um, now that is because I know that I can go overboard and get way too deep into stuff. Um, so that's just kind of, um, where I'm at. And I know those questions are very interesting. I guess I, I think that like 
the specifics of interactions and stuff, and the specifics of what medications do, the specifics of um, how people build lives, um, I think are very interesting. And so I like to think on a smaller scale these days. Yeah, I'm, I'm also susceptible or have been susceptible to utopianism and try not to go down that way. But uh, I am an anarchist. The thing about anarchy is that the people that are actually pra practicing anarchy are not anarchists. They do not identify as anarchists. Like, you'll find like a lot of conservative Christians practicing anarchy, mutual aid. Uh, and uh, people just, you know, willingly helping each other out yeah. or patching holes in the road or things like that or um, uh, being in recovery groups and just helping each other out. So I, uh, I really think the most, this is like totally try it, you know, really the most, if not revolutionary, I don't, I'm not really interested in revolution at this point. It kills a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the most, uh, the best thing people can do for the world is to be decent human beings and help their neighbor. Mm -hmm. And the best way to fight fascism is to not behave like a fascist. Karina have something to say oh. about that? Oh. <laughs> In the back. Red shirt. Um, one concern I have is that attention span is finite. Not ours, but ours. <laughs> 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 I actually mean, Wants us to leave. it is nearly <laughs> impossible to follow uh, the academical backdrop of this discussion for a normal human. <laughs> and what is happening in the rest of the country and in the rest of the world is the rising of a far more dangerous darkness than the one hill that we are trying to die on because of one division. And to me, it appears that the two apparent sides of this debate are actually natural allies against a far greater danger. And so it pains me to see friends on both sides uh, with justifiable perspectives that fray one another with great conviction, whereas we see something akin to the end of democracy in our lifetimes. And as we know from history, it is always propagates in a way where we divide so that they can conquer minorities, so that minorities can see one another as enemies. And whether these are based on race or ethnicity or gender, this is not too different. So what are practical steps where we can say, we do not need to pick whether we protect vulnerable women who have concerns about spaces that they need to find shelter in because they have been abused, and people that, like, that look like me have been the cause of it, more often than that. People that look like me have been the privileged that have trampled over other people's rights. And when they say that, I don't want you in this space because you frighten me, I must listen to this. And I am not permitted to dictate that I have a right to be where they don't want me to be. Yet also, Can you people that identify something other than they are born, why should they not be protected for what they choose. To me, this is a false dichotomy. We don't need to choose one or the other. They are, as somebody over there said, these are orthogonal needs. We need to insist on both, and we need to not compromise. Right, we need, we need to not conflate them in the same laws. That's, it's like very understood. The problem is that they've been conflated in the same laws, and we need to not do that. That's it, very simple. And I would really like to disagree with you very politely. People that identify as women, that are men, that have um, are being placed in women's prisons. They are raping women in prisons because they identify as women. Women's shelters are being shut down because they do not um, allow these men who identify as women to use these shelters. Women are getting hurt on sports fields because they're playing against men who identify as women. 
there's a lot of actual physical things um, that are happening to women's bodies because of this. And I don't know if denying biological reality is, is um, a civil right. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Just to kind of respond to that, I worry all the time about whether I'm helping Trump get reelected. Mm -hmm. Like, I, like um, there is a way that by us, like, making this issue really prominent, we're um, absolutely helping people in Nebraska be like, what the hell is up with the Democrats? Um, <laughs> and the problem is that, like, um, when this viewpoint has, like, uh, the ACLU is really promoting this viewpoint in a way right. Planned Parenthood is, so in a perfect world, the left could have this discussion and work it out without everyone seeing. But like, I'm gonna be real, like I think that Trump's gonna get reelected. And I think it's gonna be because of cultural stuff like this. Because oh. it is insane what we're letting oh, yeah. happen to kids. Yeah. We're wrong on that. Yeah. And one more question, this is gonna be the last yeah. question. Okay, last question. Continue <laughs> on with t and talk about the Equality Act. Because oh, frankly, yes. oh. yeah, I'm, I'm leaving the Democratic Party over this. I'm not going to be a Republican, but I'm changing my registration to Independent over the Equality Act. Wow. Thank so, you. Yes, so the talk. Equality Act. Yeah. So I think it should be called the Female Erasure Act. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, is, this is on a national level. What's happened to Title IX in the state of Illinois, this is going to conflate gender identity with sex, or really, Erase sex in favor of gender identity or redefine sex as gender identity nationally. And this is going to totally undermine women's rights everywhere. And every Democrat's on board with it. Yeah, well, well uh, I mean, maybe there's a few that are. Can I just say something quickly? That the Equality Act also wants to protect the rights of lesbians and gay people, and um, that that. Maybe the wording about gender identity could be changed in the Equality Act and it could be fixed so that it could be protecting a, a The bill they're sending for the House right now, though, says it is not fixed. I and, know, but... And I'm speaking as a lesbian feminist here. I don't want it passed in the form that it is. Right, in the form that it is, but I mean, what, what I, I know a lot of um, leftist feminists and what they're concerned about is that if we get on board with saying we don't want the Equality Act at all, it's going to erase the protections that, that in, are intended in the Equality Act for gay yeah, it can and be, lesbian people. It can people. be postponed. It's more important to protect women's rights at this point. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, I'm a lesbian, yes, but I'm also a woman. And, and women are always at the bottom of the heap. Everybody but don't bills get tweaked? Aren't they yeah, supposed to be discussed and no, tweaked? They get tweaked the wrong way. way. <laughs> so we can have some closing Listen, remarks. Suffering protection, sex, no. gender identity, no. gender identity no. and sexual orientation. Okay. Suffering. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. So we're going to close soon. <laughs> I am so freaking grateful for you. I'm so grateful. <laughs>
didn't even listen to it. I just I